Welcome to NCBA's Cattleman's Call podcast with host Lane Nordland. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Cattleman's Call podcast. I'm your host, Lane Nordland, and our conversation will be with Mark Upton. He's a cattle producer from Oklahoma and a face that is familiar to many in the cattle business. But first off, I would just like to give a big shout out to a partner of the Cattleman's Call podcast, a new partner that is, and that is our friends at Central Life Sciences. We would just like to thank them for supporting the podcast and helping us answer the Cattleman's Call. But as we get back to today's podcast, I would just like to welcome Oakland. Oklahoma's Mark Upton. He is joining us here today. He actually is the director of sales for the livestock feed additive brands at Central Life Sciences. And Mark, as folks uh, finish up calving here this spring, also getting calves branded, and there's a lot on their minds, and many are just ready for some nice weather and to turn out to pasture or folks out in feedlot country uh, getting some spring chores and cleaning done. There's a lot on producers' mind, and taking care of our critters, of course, is our top priority. And uh, Mark, uh, how is your day going there in Oklahoma? It's going great. I appreciate you asking. We've actually got sunshine today and clear skies. We uh, we were about oh seventy two degrees, I think, on Monday, and uh, then we had a cold front move through. We were actually twenty nine degrees this morning, but now we're headed all the way back up to. I think we're supposed to get back in the seventies by the weekend. So it's it's a great day. <laughs> Green grass is coming on, and we're pretty excited. Well, here in Montana, the sun's shining, but it's only about 34 <laughs> degrees, and I got my little milk heater going underneath my feet here in my office. Uh, I uh, understand. But yeah, same thing here. It's been up into the 60s and 70s, and then we had a blizzard on Monday, and uh, wow. Sunday and Monday, and and of course, uh, that always does create concern for the grain producers out there, and especially corn. That's That's been impacting the feeder market so much here, especially with export news. I know a lot of producers watching just how that uh, corn crop is going to be shaping up. Uh, definitely one of the top top issues that's going to impact uh, our calf prices here in 2021. But, you know, also, Mark, uh, items that impact calf prices is, of course, uh, cattle health and productivity. And uh, w- with your position at Central Live Sciences, uh, you're in the business of helping producers uh, uh, have healthy livestock. And uh, could you maybe just talk a little more about maybe your background before we jump into uh, the opportunity that you have to work with cattlemen and women, but uh, uh, a little bit about your background and uh, did you grow up in the livestock industry? Actually, I did, Lane. I actually grew up in eastern Oklahoma. My dad managed a large ranch. Uh, at any given time, that ranch would have twelve to 1,400 head of, of uh, brood cows. And then there was times they'd run as many as 4,000 head of stalkers. So we grew up, uh, we grew up running those, uh, running that ranch, spent a lot of time horseback, um, really enjoyed it. Uh, once I got uh, out of high school, went off to college, got a degree from Oklahoma State University. And then due to just some, I guess, the stars aligning, I actually moved to the southeast and went to work for a mineral company out there. And uh, my wife and I did. I got married right out of college. In fact, I graduated one Saturday and got married the next Saturday. And uh, lived out in, in South Carolina for about four years and then was fortunate enough to get uh, take a, a uh, promotion and move back to Oklahoma. And I've been back here now for, oh, 20-something years. Been doing this for a long, long time. Uh, really enjoy what I do. I, I really enjoy uh, animal production. I, I have a have a good time with it. We've got a small uh, cow herd uh, and raise some horses. I like in my free time, I like to train calf roping horses. And so I, I play with that a little bit and, uh, and just really enjoyed it. Married the wife of a veterinarian. And after 31 years of marriage, I'm still just the dummy that married his daughter. But, but it's, been a good, uh, it's been a good run. I've, I've learned a lot from him. And I'd like to think he's learned a little bit from me. Um, but it's just my passion. You know, I heard a long time ago, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. And I really do love what I do. No, that there is no truer statement. So, Mark, what kind of cattle are you running down there in Oklahoma? They're commercial cows. Uh, they they're, they would be mostly Angus, but they are commercial cows. Um, and in fact, just had our last calf born yesterday. Uh, we try to keep it back a few first calf heifers every year. And, 
and uh, just just really love it. My, my I would be lying if I said the cows weren't my wife's first love. She really enjoys the cows, and so uh, it's just uh, it's just good for us. It was a good environment to raise the kids in, and we really uh, we really love it. Playing around with uh, calf roping horses, there there's always folks looking for a good uh, good horse with a good stop, and of course, uh, not a lot of good trained calf roping horses out there in the marketplace. So uh, may, maybe you could give a, a, a personal pitch for that uh, here in the uh, after hours podcast, Mark. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. In, in your day to day working with cattle producers, uh, uh, you want to. Uh, be a resource and knowledge for these producers that are looking to take care of their livestock and animal health and nutrition being a big part of that. But uh, we all know that pests can play a big role in profitability and herd health and condition. And in your line of work, uh, what are some of that? What are one of those key pests that uh, impact uh, beef operations out across the countryside? You know, you're, you're, you're very correct, Lane. It's, uh, those, those cows, they, they take as best care of us as they can. We, we got to try to take care of them. And as a kid, I can remember working cows with my father and, uh, and boy, you just, you get those cows all up in a lot and you couldn't open your mouth unless you wanted a mouthful of flies. And what I now know fast forward 20 years is those are what's called a horn fly. Uh, horn fly is a, is a little bitty fly that, that spins its whole life on the back of a cow. It, it literally only leaves the cow to lay its eggs in really fresh manure. And, and, and what just so many producers don't realize is the number one, the absolute number one economic threat to their cows on pasture is the horn fly. Uh, it's doing more damage than coccidiosis or, or I- anything. I mean, it, it is the biggest problem. If you're in the South, Anaplasmosis is a problem, but it pales in comparison to what that horn fly is doing. And so you mentioned we like to offer solutions. We really do. Um, I have a team of people that uh, work across North America, and all of us are like-minded. We we really don't see ourselves as salespeople. We we really enjoy getting out on the farm, walking the walking the pastures, looking at cows. We really do enjoy that. Most of the people on my team have cows of their own. And so they understand what it, what it takes to, to get good results. And uh, we, we really enjoy it. We feel like we've got some great products. We've got some great solutions. We're not the only game in town, but we feel like we're a pretty big, uh, a pretty important part of, of the game. Now, with that, uh, maybe let's talk a little more about the anatomy and life to- lifespan mm-hmm. of these flies. Uh, um, how long, like you mentioned, of course, we, we all know where, where they lay their eggs. It's down in the manure. Mm-hmm. But uh, uh, when's really the time that they really start uh, popping up and impacting producers? Obviously, it's different parts of the nation, uh, different times of the season. But uh, uh, maybe let's walk through that life stage. Yeah, absolutely. So yes, the further south you are, the more the more days of warmth, warm weather you have, the longer your fly season's going to be. But at the beginning of this of this discussion, we were talking about different temperatures and stuff. Well, you know, we oh, I can't remember dates, but back oh a couple months ago now, we uh, we got pretty warm, and and I was literally I was riding a three year old out across the pasture looking at a set of cows. And had flies buzzing around me, driving the colt and myself nuts. And and about a week after that, we had the worst cold spell in Texas and Oklahoma that we've ever had, um, ever. Um, there were, you know, we got down to, we were 13 below one day. Um, in fact, on a Tuesday morning, we were 13 below. And one week later, we were 70 degrees above. So, so my point, of having said all that, is... When those temperatures start getting up into the 60 degree area, you're going to have flies come out. Now, it may get cold again and kind of stun them, stun them, but but you're going to have flies when it gets pretty warm. Flies, I've, I've started having some flies appear on my cows over the last week or so. Well, we got down below freezing last night, and so we're going to stun some of those flies and we're going to set them back. But I can assure you, this is Wednesday, by the weekend, we're going to have flies on those cows again. So you got to look at the temperature. Once it starts hitting about that 60 degrees for just a few days in a row, boy, it's time to start doing something. I mean, it, you, flies are, are there. They're, they're on their way. And if you're not careful, you'll turn around twice and you got a problem. Um, so you really got to watch the temperature uh, on the beginning of the season to see when it's time to start taking care of these flies. We actually 
would recommend that as you're watching the weather, about two to four weeks, we say 30 days, but two to four weeks ahead of those temperatures hitting 60 degrees, you need to start putting some stuff out in front of those cows to prevent fly populations. Well, and a lot of folks just, uh, when they can see a, a, a number in terms of how much money it, it may cost mm-hmm. them in terms of uh, uh, weight that uh, the cattle may lose or just b- body conditioning, could you maybe quantify that for us and, and paint a picture for just the financial impact that the horn flies have? Yeah, I think it's important. What you got to realize is these horn flies only feed on blood. And so... You know, whether you're, uh, you know, whatever it is you're feeding, hay, protein, vitamins, minerals, energy, whatever, um, whatever you're feeding to that animal, that fly is pulling blood off their back. And so all that nutrition that you're feeding is just having to go, first of all, to replenish that blood supply. They're not going to wean off a heavier calf. You know, they're not going to give good milk. They're not going to be growing a baby. They're not going to be doing all that up to their genetic potential until they've got that blood loss replaced. Um, in some stalker trial work that we did at Oklahoma State back a few years ago, it was about a 16% difference in average daily gain. Uh, those animals that were, were taken care of with flies versus the control group. Um, we know that these cows are under stress. Um, we also know, and that, that's just from a weight gain standpoint, we also know there's some diseases that you need to be concerned with as, as well. So, um, you know, you're going to, it's going to cost you, oh, depending on the weight of the cow, somewhere between two to three cents per head per day. Um, there's some there's some numbers thrown around in popular press that if you don't do anything to prevent horn flies on a cow, it's going to cost you roughly 40 bucks per cow in economic losses. Well, I'll typically tell a producer, man, let's say that $40 is ridiculous. Let's say that's way too high. In fact, let's say it's twice too high. Let's say if you don't do anything to control the flies on your cows, it's going to cost you $20. Well, heck, you can spend four to six bucks on a feed-through fly control product and put that other $14 or $15, $13, $14, $15 in your pocket. Um, it, it's just, it's not very expensive to do something about these flies. You just got to make the decision you're going to do it. I'm just amazed in shock that losses from horn flies cost the cattle industry an estimated $1 billion each year due to the stress that they're inflicting and, uh, the disease that they spread. And they are a huge threat and do have an impact on the cattle industry and the pocketbooks of cattlemen and women. So for producers that are making the decision to uh, try to prevent horn flies or reduce their impact on their cattle herds. Working with individuals like yourself or the, the team members you have out across the country, what, what are some of those uh, uh, key uh, solutions you have or some of the products that producers uh, utilize uh, to help control these horn flies? Well, we have we have two different divisions. Uh, one of the one of the divisions that we have would be what we would call packaged goods, and we've got some of the traditional sprays and and pour-ons and things like that. Those are what you would call hard kill strategies. They kill adult flies. The problem with those strategies is that you build resistance. Same thing if you're putting an insecticidal ear tag in a cow. Um, if you're not real careful with how you utilize those, you're going to cause resistance, um, and, and that's a problem. The product that we recommend for pastured cattle is called Altacid. It is an, it's what's called an insect growth regulator, and what that means is you're not killing flies. You're preventing immatures from becoming an adult, and we're just using that cow as a mechanism. So we're feeding it to the cow just so she can mix it up and put it out in the manure because, as I mentioned a while ago, these flies only lay their eggs in manure. So when that fly flies off the back of that cow, lays its egg in the manure, we're tricking that egg or that juvenile from thinking that it's maturing to an adult when actually it's going to die as an immature. It will never become an adult fly. Um, there's no resistance issues to it. There's no labor. You don't have to get those cows up in the heat of the summer and put a tag in their ear or spray on their back. Uh, you don't have to worry about if you've sprayed them and going getting in the pond and killing fish. Um, it, it, it works really, really, really well. Now there is some management with it. It's not a silver bullet. Uh, you know, we've got, uh, we still aren't breeding cows to be able to read a label. 
And so we've got to make sure that we're placing these free choice products in areas where these cows are going to be frequenting so that we get intake. Uh, but it works really, really real, well. I've, I personally have been with this company for about 18 years. I've used this product for over 20 years and, and saw it being used when I was a kid. Uh, it, it's just a super great product. And like I said, about two to three cents per head per day, there's nothing else on the market that you can get near that good of control for anywhere near that price. And just to confirm, it's not going to build up that resistance uh, like the applications, uh, correct? Absolutely correct. That is absolutely correct. There has never been any documented cases of resistance to this product. And and because of I, I can't get into the chemistry of it much because I'm I will get way over my head really, really fast. But um, because of the way the product works, its mode of action, our entomologists tell us that there is a likelihood there will never be a resistance built to this product. And as you mentioned, uh, folks need to watch the weather and uh, all the all the other factors that go into to ranching. But mainly, uh, when you're wanting to uh, uh, make sure that your cows are, are up to speed uh, with the product, um, what what's the best way to administer the ration? Well, so we would be uh, these products are regulated by the EPA, and most most things that we deal with as cattlemen are FDA regulated, but these are EPA regulated. And so what what happens is is we sell these products to feed companies. They have a they have what's uh, they're called an EPA established facility. And so they would be buying these products from us and they would be putting them in free choice minerals. They would be putting them in these uh, mineral tubs, these 225 or 50 pound tubs that you can put out in front of your cows, or you can get it in liquid feed. So however you're delivering your vitamin and mineral supplements, um, there are every, almost every company across the U.S. would have a version of that supplement with Altacid in it. So it's pretty easy to find. And of course, folks might, you know, be turned out to summer pasture. What are some of the best strategies uh, that uh, that maybe your feed expert or your team suggest uh, in making sure that uh, cattle uh, get that full, full ration, whether that is through the tubs or liquid or whatever it might be? Well, one of the key things is to make sure you have enough feeders out for, for the number of cows. Most uh, some, some feed companies are a little bit different, but somewhere in my, in my pea brain, the number that always I'm able to remember is somewhere around one feeder per around 25 head of cows. So whether that's now the liquid feeder may be a little different, but I know with the tubs and, and, the, and the loose mineral feeders, about, about one per 25 head. And I can tell you, it's not at all uncommon for us to go on a, a, a producer's place and find one mineral feeder for 200 head of cows. Well, they've got to have access to it so that they can so that they can eat it. That's that's the first key thing. The other one is is you know if you've got big pastures now you know you get in parts of the country where pasture sizes are pretty small, but if you got big pastures, you got to put those things out where the cattle are going to be. Um, those cows are probably not going to walk an extreme long distance every day to get their to meet their mineral needs. Um, and, and so therefore, they're not going to get the opposite in them either. So, you know, if, if uh, it gets in hot times of the summer, oftentimes I'll put my my mineral feeders kind of where they're shaded up. You know, they're getting in the hot part of the day that gives them an opportunity to to take a, 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 a meal of mineral. Uh, sometimes I'll put feeders close to the ponds, you know, they're going to, you know, they're going to go there for water. So there's a little bit of management involved. Um, but it's not, it's, it's not out of line with what you're doing on a, on a pretty regular basis anyway. And that will help to ensure that intake. Now, as you mentioned, this is just uh, one tool to help uh, help keep your cattle healthy. Uh, what are some other tips that you share with producers in, in helping control flies uh, out on the operations? Well, especially in parts of the country where the pastures are smaller, you know, round bells are really popular. And, and horn flies won't, but house flies and face flies like to to lay their eggs in this, well, and stable flies too, like to lay their eggs in this rotting, decaying organic matter. So if you've got a pile of hay stacked up somewhere and at the, at the end of the feeding season, you know, it's just a mush of wasted hay and manure and, and it's moist, boy, that is absolute perfect breeding ground for these flies. So it's really important to try to dry that out, drag it out, scrape it out, get it dried out so that those so that those those eggs won't uh, they'll die and won't and won't mature into an adult fly. 
really important to do that. We, we see that a lot. A lot of times we'll get phone calls, Lane, they'll say, well, your product's not working because I got fly problems. But we go out and look, they do have fly problems, but it has nothing to do with the feed through. It has to do with they've got, you know, their, um, whether it's it's the center part of the country where the pastures are small and they're using a lot of round bales and they've got this this rotting material. We've had calls before from the state of Florida where they're feeding a lot of waste produce and that in troughs and that, you know, those those rotted watermelons and things like that are just got house flies by the millions. So, you know, there's some things, some cultural practices that you may have to do in some parts of the country to help clean up and and give these, uh, you know, give give anything a fighting chance. It wouldn't matter if you're using a spray or a tag or this feed through. You've got to do some cultural things and some management things every now and then to, to give anything a fighting chance. Now, what are maybe some of the, the myths that are out there about fly control or maybe just some oddball questions you get from producers that uh, that you help uh, shed some light on on the benefits of helping control horn flies? Oh, the two big ones that we've been hearing, I, we probably hear it less today than we did when I started back in 2002. But, oh, the two big ones that stick out in my head is one is, well, my neighbor's not doing anything to control flies, so I'm not going to either. And that, that is just a huge mistake. You know, I'm, I'm sitting here in South central Oklahoma. I've got, uh, I've got cows on three sides of me right now and they don't do anything for horn fly control. Uh, and yet my cows stay pretty clean. Now the, these horn flies are terrible flyers. They don't fly very well at all. But if my cows end up next to a shared fence, and uh, and some flies fly out of my neighbor's manure if they're going to land on my cows there's no doubt about it but it's never going to be at what we would call an economic threshold 200 flies per cow we say is this threshold anything above that they're doing damage anything below that they're just a nuisance so i'm just not going to let my neighbors determine my management strategy I'm, I'm just not the other thing we hear a lot is well you know i mentioned earlier we need to get started right ahead of the fly season and we'll have people all the time, you know, middle of June, first of July, whatever. They'll they'll call us and say, well, it's just too late. I, you know, it's too late to start this year. I'll get after it next year. And that's just not the case either. There's no sense in letting those flies uh, rob you of profits for the rest of that fly season. So get started on the product that day. If you'll if you'll get out to sit out in front of them the day that you decide to cry uncle, then we, we just got to wait on those adults to die off. So it takes about three weeks before we start seeing a reduction in the number of flies, or they could start out to sit on day one and then come in a week or so later and spray those cows and kill off those adults. And, and then you'll just speed up that time from when the opposite will really start, you know, kicking in. So those are probably the two biggest things uh, that, that just, you know, I, I don't want to call them excuses, but it's just, it's myths that, that you shouldn't let hamstring you. Mm -hmm. So for our uh, cattlemen and women that are tuning in today that uh, maybe are, are, are intrigued by what we're, we're, what we're talking about here today, uh, how can they find product that has Alta Soot in it? The best thing they can do is whatever feed company that they're buying their mineral or their tubs or their liquid feed from is talk to that rep, go to that feed store or talk to that feed company rep and say, Hey, what choices do you have? What products do you have with Alphacid in it? Um, that's the best way. I would also tell you they can, uh, if, if they struggle with that or if they just don't feel comfortable with it, they can go to our website, which is alphacidigr.com. Um, we've got a, a, a tab there to contact us. We'd be happy to get in touch with you and, and help you find the products. But like I said earlier, there's almost no feed company in the U.S. that we're not doing business with. And so it's very likely that that feed store or if they've got contact with the feed company rep, they can steer them in the right direction. It's it's pretty common that, that it happens that way. Well, Mark, uh, we, we covered a lot of very important information here today, and, and I really appreciate you helping dispel some of those myths uh, that producers have out there. And, you know, when we hear things at the stockyards or local cafe, sometimes uh, uh, people take it as gospel, and they probably shouldn't. That's one case. Just because your neighbors aren't doing it uh, doesn't mean you shouldn't be doing it to help uh, take care of your cattle and, and, and keep earning money on the pounds on your cattle as well. Um, Mark, uh, any last information you would just like to share with our audience here today uh, or just anything in general 
Lane, the only other thing I'd point out is this. We've talked quite a little bit about when to get started in the beginning of the season and why you should get started and all that. But the one thing we haven't talked about, and I see this happening all the time for several different reasons, with with whatever type of fly control you, you've employed, we tend to get out towards the end of the season and we quit. And we quit too early. And I don't know if that's just because we're tired of doing whatever it is we're doing. I don't know if it's because we're just ready for the hot summer to be over and head into fall. I don't know what it is, but we tend to get out towards the end of the season. We've had really good fly control. We worked hard at it all season long, but then we get towards the end of the season. It's still warm enough for flies, but we quit doing what we're doing. And the problem with that is, and I ask producers all the time, okay, the flies you're seeing today in April of 21, where did they come from? Well, they overwintered from the winter of 2020. So the best strategy is start early, but you got to stay late. You got to keep fighting these flies until you get a good, hard killing frost at the end of the season. Once you get that good, hard killing frost, these flies go into basically a hibernation. It's called diapause, but they go to sleep for the summer or excuse me, for the winter. So so I, I, I see that all the time. Um, it, it just it's just a shame that you've worked all summer, but then we stop too too soon. So I, I would encourage people get started early, but don't quit until a good hard killing frost out in the fall and early winter. Well, that's a great tip and, and just things that people need need to think about, especially as uh, we move into these months where the, the flies will be awakening from their winter dormancy and uh, having an impact on our herds. And, and as Mark uh, said, altacidigr.com, it's a great uh, resource to learn more about how fly control built by science can help out your operation. Uh, but Mark, uh, are, are, are you looking forward to the uh, Cattle Industry Convention 2021 coming up in Nashville? Well, I got to tell you, I am. In fact, just had a conference call with some folks from the NCBA yesterday, and I know it's you know it's fluid. Every it's changing every week as to as to what it's going to look like. But I'm I'm so excited. We uh, for anybody that's that's been in the past knows we've we always have a big party on Thursday nights, and and just look forward to it every year because of the changing of the dates. This year it'll be on a Wednesday night, but but as of yesterday, we're planning on having that. We're extremely excited. I have a feeling that 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 anybody that shows up to convention is going to be excited about just just kicking back and relaxing and having a good time. And we're so excited. You know, we've like most companies, we've been kind of locked down for a while. We I've, I've got people on my staff I haven't seen for a year. And boy, I just can't I just can't wait. I, I wish it was tomorrow. I'm I'm really excited about it. Yeah, and folks are just ready to break through uh, the barriers and the struggle that the pandemic put on all of us. And again, we're going to be tuning in to Tennessee, as the slogan says, August 10th through the 12th, 2021 in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, you can visit convention.ncba.org uh, for more on that event. And hey, you can even hopefully go see Mark Upton and his uh, partners there at Central Life Sciences uh, at the convention. I, I just can't wait to see everybody in Nashville, Mark. I'm the same, Lane. I'm really excited about it. I I, uh, I think a lot of people are going to be excited to be there. Uh, hopefully, more and more of these restrictions will be lifted. Uh, it's going to be a little different because you know it's going to be warm for a convention versus cold or cool like it normally is. So, um, yeah, I'm I'm excited. Well, it's going to be a great time, and uh, also for our listeners uh, and attendees at the convention, we are going to have a live space to do live podcast broadcasts, so uh, we're, we're looking uh, forward to that as well. But uh, uh, before we wrap up today's conversation, just a big shout-out to our friends at Central Life Sciences for uh, joining the Cattlemen's Call podcast team, helping uh, sponsor it and bring uh, great conversations from the countryside, um, broadcasting for where I am, from where Mark's at to where you're tuning in today. We appreciate all of our listeners and, uh, again, the support from Central Live Sciences. But, uh, Mark, uh, I'll let you get back to your day there in Oklahoma, and we hope to see you down in Nashville. Lane, I appreciate so much your time, and I look forward to it too, brother. I'll buy you a cold beer. Ooh, I will not turn one of those down, especially at the <laughs> Opryland. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, friends, that will do it for this edition of the Cattleman's Call podcast. I'm your host, Lane Nordland. We'll catch you next time. Thanks for tuning in to NCBA's Cattleman's Call podcast with Lane Nordland. 
For more information, visit ncba.org and make sure to subscribe to the podcast today.